Hey everybody, this is the start of chapter three on matter and energy. We're gonna go through the whole chapter. It's a lot of vocabulary and a lot of concepts and no math. So I'm sure you'll be happy to hear that after chapter two. Um, we're not gonna do a whole lot of examples in this one. We're gonna save that for the live lecture. So I'll give you a taste of the types of questions that you'll see on homework and exams and stuff like that. I know everybody's probably not even going to be thinking about Chapter 3 right now because we have an exam coming up. But don't get behind. If you're watching this video, you're probably not getting behind. So keep it up. All right. So Chapter 3, Matter and Energy. Let's define matter. Matter is any substance that has mass and occupies volume. So your laptop, whatever it's sitting on, you, um, everything that you can touch, the air that you breathe, all that stuff is matter. And matter exists in one of three physical states. We've got solids, liquids, and gases. This shouldn't be news to you because you've been in school for quite some time. And even if not, even if you took a break between high school and college, you probably know solids, liquids, and gases. So let's talk a little bit more about the the definitions of these. So if you're a solid, you have a definite fixed shape. So that means you can't really crush it. Um, you can't really change its shape. You can't compress it. It has a definite volume. It's not going to expand or contract based on the temperature or the volume of whatever you can't if you take yourself and you put yourself in a big room, you're still going to have the same volume as if you were in a little room, right? So your your size, your shape is definite, okay? You're not just a melty pool of body, right? That's a weird image. I'm sorry, y'all. Then we have the liquid state. So liquids have an indefinite shape. So if you pour a glass of water then that's the shape of the of the water. You pour it into something else, maybe you're filling a pot to boil some pasta or some rice, then it's going to take the shape of whatever container you're putting the water in. Liquids cannot be compressed, and they also have a definite volume. So even though the shape of the liquid may change based on the container, the amount of water that's in it doesn't change. So if you take a little cup and fill it with water, then you dump that water into a bigger cup, it's still going to be the same volume. It's not going to fill up the big cup just because it's in a big cup. And finally, the gaseous state. So gases have an indefinite shape, just like liquids. So they assume the shape of their container. You have an oval container or a gas cylinder. That's the shape the gas is going to be in. You put it into a cube, now it's going to be a cube. But gases can be compressed, and they have an indefinite volume. So that means that you can take one volume of gas and smush it down into something, and then you can also relieve that pressure, and the gas will expand to fill whatever container, um, whatever space is available. So the volume of a gas is indefinite. It will change along with the shape of the container. And we talked about solids, liquids, and gases and some of their physical characteristics. But we also need to talk about their energy. And we can't talk about that without the kinetic molecular theory. The theory just simply states that the more energy a substance has, the farther apart its molecules are. So if we have molecules that are really tightly packed, like this, that's going to be low energy. But if we have them spaced out, like this, that's high energy. That's all that's saying. So the further apart the molecules are, the more energy they're going to have. For a solid, the particles of matter are tightly packed together. Okay, So that's the first example that I did, like this. 
So think about those being tightly packed together. It has the least energy of the three states of matter. The liquid state is kind of in the middle. So the particles are kind of loosely packed and they're free to move. So water is always the liquid of choice when thinking about this because we encounter water every day. Think about a nice flowing river or something like that. Loosely packed, free to move. So we'll space them a little bit more, a little bit further apart. Less energy than gases, but more energy than solids. So loosely packed. Energy between solids and gases. Okay, that's kind of middle of the road. And finally, we have gases. So Gases, they their particles are very far apart, and they're uniformly distributed throughout the container. Remember that we said that gas will expand or contract based on the size of the container, so its volume is indefinite. Gases have the most energy of the three states of matter. So we're talking about far off, y'all, okay? Far apart, highest energy. So if I gave you some images of molecules really close together or really far apart, you should be able to sort through them and say, okay, this substance has the highest energy, this has the lowest, this might be in the middle, just based on how far apart the particles are from each other. This table summarizes um, what we're talking about in terms of the properties of solids, liquids, and gases. So the shape, the volume, and whether or not you can compress um, each state of matter. Know this table. If you can know and explain what fixed versus variable is, and then know, okay, gases are the only things that can be compressed, like for real, for real, then you should be good to go. So know this chart. Don't just memorize the chart, but be able to explain it and understand what, um, what property the solids, liquids, and gases have and be able to give an example. We have three states of matter. Most substances can exist as any of those states. So again, we go to our example of water. When it's below zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, you're gonna have ice, right? That's solid water. As a liquid, it's gonna be anywhere between zero and 100 degrees Celsius. So most of the water we encounter is liquid water. And then above 100 degrees Celsius, it's a gas. So that's just one example, but that's many things that exist can be in any of the physical states of matter. So that must mean that you can transition from one physical state of matter to another. When you transition from a solid to a liquid, that's called melting. So think about ice melting, okay? That is a phase change. So you're going from solid to liquid. It's called melting. As it melts, you're going to have an increase in temperature. That's not rocket science. Think about it. You have some ice, you put it in a, in a drink, right? 
maybe you popped open a can of soda or I like sparkling water because I'm bougie, okay? And I don't really like soda. So open up that can of sparkling water, pour it over some ice, put a little couple of mint leaves in it because I'm just like that. I'm special. Okay, guys. As that drink starts to cool down, your ice is heating up and it's starting to melt. So you got to hit that sweet spot before it's all watery, right? So that's not, that's intuitive. When a liquid changes to a solid, we're calling it freezing. So it's when you're making ice, when you're getting ready for that party that you can no longer hold in your apartment or dorm because of COVID, that's called freezing. So we're going from a liquid to a solid. And obviously, as it freezes, the temperature is going to decrease. So here's a question. We're going from a solid to a liquid. And we have the temperature increasing. That makes sense for another reason, too. We're going from something that's low energy, like a solid, like ice, to something that's higher energy. The energy has to come from somewhere. So as you're increasing the temperature of that solid, you're putting energy into the system. So you're increasing the energy of that substance so that it can transition from being a low energy solid to a higher energy liquid. And the opposite is true when you're freezing something. That heat is being drawn out. And so you're going from the higher energy, you're dropping some of that energy out to make a solid. The next thing we're going to talk about is liquid to gas and gas to liquid. So when a liquid changes to a gas, we're talking about vaporizing. So you're going to increase the temperature to go from that liquid to the gas. When you go from a gas to a liquid, it's condensing. So we've all seen that, you know, um, some condensation on the glass, right? Like let's say it's a really hot day, and so you got cold glass because you're running your air conditioner. You might see some condensation on the glass. Or at night, when it gets really cool and then it starts warming up in the car, you might see some condensation on the glass. So when we're going from that gas back to a liquid, we are condensing. And the temperature is going down. Same idea here. The liquid is the lower energy. The gas is higher. So if you're trying to go from a lower energy state to a higher energy state, you have to put energy in. That means you're going to increase the temperature. If you're going from a higher energy state to a lower energy state, you got to remove some energy. So think about it in terms of energy as well, because we're going to be talking about energy towards the end of this chapter. Finally, we can actually go straight from a solid to a gas. That's not super common, but the one example is if you've ever seen any sci-fi movie or any kind of a movie where there's some mad scientist and you see all of those beakers and flasks and stuff on this huge messy desk and it's all these different colors with smoke coming up. That, my friends, is carbon dioxide. To be exact, it's solid carbon dioxide, aka dry ice and some water that's been colored with dye. 
no special tricks or science there, okay? But what you are observing is solid carbon dioxide going directly to the gas stage, and that's called sublimation. So you're going to have to increase the temperature for that because we're going from a low energy state to a high energy physical state of matter. So increase the temperature and some solids will go directly from being a solid to a gas. To do the opposite, to go from a gas directly to a solid, that's called deposition. and your temperature is going to decrease for that process. Again, you're going from high energy to low energy. So some of that energy has got to go somewhere. You release it as heat. So dry ice is a great example. It, um, if you've ever received anything that's supposed to stay cold, sometimes it'll be shipped with dry ice, particularly in a lab setting. Um, you might see dry ice if you work um, for like a grocery store or something like that. Don't touch it with your bare hands because you can get freeze or burn. But I'm not going to lie. I've played with it in my day. Not recommended. Not recommended. You won't die, but it's not recommended. So this is a summary of the state changes. So as you increase your temperature, you go from solid to liquid, to gas. And all of the different terms that we're talking about, freezing, melting, condensing, vaporizing, all of those things are on this chart. Use it, understand it, be able to redraw it. And then there's also the examples with water to help you place it. Now, what I've done for you is I've removed all that so you can quiz yourself. You can write in all the different terms, and you can um, define those terms as well. So you can print this off, or if you have a tablet or something, you can write in your answers. So quiz yourself using this to make sure that you understand the different terms and where they go. You're heating up, you're cooling down, um, low energy, to high energy, all that sort of stuff. So use this empty chart to quiz yourself, and then you can look back at the completed one to check your work. So we talked about the states of matter, how you move from one state of matter to the next, and the different energy levels associated with solids, liquids, and gases. We can talk about different classifications of matter. So we're not just talking about the states of matter, but classes of matter. And we've got two big classes, mixtures and pure substances. We'll talk about each one. So mixtures are a physical blend of two or more substances and can be physically separated into its components. So if you had a container and it had water, I should have done blue for water, but you know, there's, there's my water. And then someone decided, hey, I'm gonna put some marbles or some, those little bouncy balls in the water. That's a mixture, okay? Water and bouncy balls. You can physically separate those two things from each other. Just dig your hand in there if the water isn't nasty and get those, those bouncy balls and the marbles out. That's physically separating its components, okay? A pure substance is one substance and you can't physically separate it. So an example of that would simply be water. You can't physically separate the hydrogen and the oxygen. You have to do some kind of chemical something or other to get 
oxygen gas and hydrogen gas, but you can't just reach into a bucket of water and will it to separate, okay? We ain't Moses, and even Moses did not <laughs> separate the oxygen and the hydrogen. It, the sea just split, okay? So that's pure substances. There are two types of mixtures, all right? And by the end of this, we're going to kind of build a hierarchy of the different classes. So we talked about the big definitions of mixtures and pure substances. Now we're going to talk about the types of mixtures. So just to keep you keep you grounded, we've got matter. We've got pure substances. which is much longer than I expected it to be as a phrase. And then we have mixtures. In the category of mixtures, we have heterogeneous and homogeneous. Now, you see, I do not have space to write both of those words, but they're written out here for me. So I just want you to have an idea of where we are in terms of the classification of matter. So we're under the subcategory of mixtures. Heterogeneous mixtures don't have uniform properties throughout. So if you had a mixture of sand and water, that's heterogeneous. Sand, you know what sand is like. It's gritty and everything else. And water is a liquid. A homogeneous mixture has uniform properties throughout. So salt water, you can't see the salt in it but you can separate the two by physical means. So all you have to do is heat up the water, or the salt water, the water will evaporate and it'll leave the salt. For pure substances, so now we are adding on to this little chart of mine. I'm going to abbreviate that pure subs, mixtures, we can talk about compounds and elements. So this is what we're shaping up to do. Compounds can be chemically separated into individual elements. So remember the example I gave about the water? Water is a pure substance. You can't do anything physical to it to, to separate it into individual elements. But you can do something chemical to separate it. So it is a compound. Remember, water is H2O. That's something most people know. You can't do anything physical to separate the hydrogen and the oxygen, but chemically, you can separate the two. Elements can't break down any further. There's no chemical reaction. There's nothing that you can do that's going to make an element break down into something else. That's as pure as it gets. And we're going to talk about the periodic table a little bit. That contains all the elements that we currently know about. So with pure substances, we're talking about compounds, which you have to do something chemical to separate into individual elements. And then we have elements that you can't break down any further. And like I promised, here's a little summary chart. And it shows you the relationship between mixtures and substances and things like that. So we talked about matter, and then these are the two big classes of matter, okay? Mixtures and pure substances. So you'll need to be able to tell the difference between a mixture and a pure substance. Also understand that if you physically separate a mixture, you're separating it into pure substances. Mixtures can come as two different flavors. Heterogeneous, so this is like oil and water, where you can see that the oil does not want to mix with the water. 
and then homogeneous. So this is a salt water solution. Uh, that's you can use that as an IV. Okay, so that's homogeneous. You can't see the individual particles and stuff. You don't see the salt floating around in it. If you do, that's bad. Okay. And then pure substances, we've got compounds and elements. Compounds, you can chemically separate to make elements, but you can't go any further than that. So when you think of a compound, think of water. When you think of an element, you can think of any element that you just hold on to. So gold is shown here as some gold foil. But whatever element is in your heart, that's what you can hold on to as your example. So I rec recommend knowing examples of each so that when you're asked, okay, is this one thing a heterogeneous or homogeneous mixture, you can have something to compare to in your mind versus just trying to straight up remember the definition. Examples are much more powerful than straight up definitions because definitions can be interpreted a lot of different ways sometimes. And in a test setting, sometimes your brain just be wilding. It just will tell you all types of things and you're just like, I don't know what to do. So don't do that to yourself. Have a set example of each of these that helps you remember what the interpretation of the definition is. And I'm sorry, this is a lot of talking, not a lot of examples like that. The examples are easier to do in person. And I wanted to give you a little bit less to do in terms of the lecture for chapter three, so you can prepare for your exam. So let's talk about the occurrence of elements. We just finished talking about elements as being um, a type of pure substance. There's over 100 elements that occur in nature, and 81 of those elements are stable, which means they don't just, you know, decay into something else. Only 10 elements account for more than 95% of the mass of the Earth's crust, water, and atmosphere. Isn't that crazy? 10 elements. It's 100 of them bad boys, and only a tenth of them account for, like, all the things Earth. That's kind of crazy. You don't need to know this table. You don't even really need to know this particular concept. This is just kind of a wow factor. Take it as you will. Elements in the human body. So oxygen is the most common element in Earth's crust and in our bodies. Silicon is the second most abundant in the Earth. But for us, it's carbon, okay? We are carbon and oxygen walking around. So this is a comparison of the two, the Earth's crust and the human body. A lot of oxygen. All of these elements have a unique name. And their names have different origins. They're Greek, they're Latin, Sometimes they're named after people who help discover or, or characterize them. It's kind of all over the place. And each element has an abbreviation that uses one or two letters, and that's called a chemical symbol. So we know the, the uh, compound water, well, it's made of hydrogen, which is H and oxygen, which is O. So those are the chemical symbols. When a symbol has two letters, only the first letter is capitalized. So one example that you may have seen or remembered from school is sodium. Sodium is capital N, the lowercase a. So that's an example of a two-letter symbol. You only capitalize the first letter. Otherwise, it would be kind of intimidating. Nah, I, mean, I, don't, I don't like that. That's, that's too much. It's too much. So elements can be divided into three classes. Again, with the dividing into classes, I know, I know. 
but we've got metals, which is most of the periodic table, nonmetals, and then semi-metals or metalloids, which are kind of in between metals and nonmetals. Let's talk about each one. So metals are typically solids with high melting points. So if you think about something like aluminum, so aluminum foil, if you cook anything, you grill, some you see you've been to the cookout, okay, you've seen some aluminum foil. You put it on a grill, it's quite literally sometimes over a fire. Doesn't melt. So high melting point. It takes a lot, a lot, a lot of heat to melt these things. They have high density, which means a lot of mass per volume. And they have that bright metallic luster, which means they're shiny, okay? And we know that. Think about gold, silver, platinum, all this, the jewelry stuff, it's shiny. So, ooh, shiny, high density, high melting point, and they're typically solids. Metals are good conductors, okay? So, when you think about electricity, which maybe you don't think about electricity, but the wiring that's used to wire your home, your dorm, or anywhere else that has electricity, which in the U.S. is like everywhere, you're using metal and you're using copper wire or aluminum wire. Those metals are good conductors. They're also ductile and malleable, which ductile means that you're able to draw it out into a thin wire. So again, think about the cables, all the power lines outside your house or around campus. That's what you should think about when the words ductile and malleable come up. Non-metal properties. So we talked about metals. Now we're going to talk about non-metals. They typically have low melting points, low densities, and a dull appearance. So not ooh shiny, low density, low melting point. So pretty much the opposite of metals, okay? They're terrible at conducting heat and electricity, and they're not malleable or ductile. They just crush, okay? So literally the complete opposite of metals. So if you can remember metals, just know that a non-metal is literally the complete opposite of metal, and you should be good to go. Finally, we have these semi-metals or metalloid properties, and they have properties that overlap metals and non-metals. So an example would be that silicon is a semiconductor. It will only conduct electricity under some conditions. So the metalloids are kind of like, we're not going to choose. We're just going to take a little from each side and make ourselves the best selves we can be. So there's not a whole lot of those on the periodic table. This chart summarizes everything that we just went through. So you will need to know all of these different things here. Okay, And we didn't talk about chemical reactivity. But metals and nonmetals, so metals will react with nonmetals, but you're not going to get a metal reacting with metal. So metal plus nonmetal, we're going to give that a green check mark, okay? However, metal plus metal. That's a no. No, no, no. We can also add non-metal plus non-metal. And that can absolutely happen. Think about water. That's two non-metals. So that's a yes. Okay. But this table summarizes everything that we just talked about in terms of the differences between metals and nonmetals. And that's kind of the main thing that you need to know. And then just know that semi-metals or metalloids are in between. They kind of have characteristics of both. 
if you can memorize one type, which I think metals are easier because you have kind of everyday experience with metals that you can use to help you figure out the physical state and appearance and everything else. If you know metal, then the opposite is true for non-metals. So let's talk about the periodic table, okay? We talked about the types of um, elements, the metals, non-metals, metalloids, and the different states of matter that they can be in. Let's talk a little bit about the organization of the periodic table. So each element is assigned a number to identify it. So you have that symbol, for example, the hydrogen is the H. It also has an atomic number, which is used to identify it. And that's going to be, usually it's above the symbol. That is the atomic number. And I'll just write here that this is the symbol for completion's sake. The elements are arranged by atomic number. So they're actually arranged by increasing atomic number. Here is a periodic table. And what's shown here, you've got three different colors, purple, green, and yellow. The purple elements are all the metals. That's most of the periodic table. I mean, look at this, guys. The majority of the periodic table is metals. So I could ask you, which is more highly represented in, you know, on the periodic table, metals, non-metals, or semi-metals? And you would tell me metals, because they are. Then you've got your non-metals. Let's try to get hydrogen in there, too. It's kind of off on its own, but. Then you have the non-metal, clearly not as many, but that is the second biggest category. And then kind of right in between on the diagonal here, that's our semi-metals. So they straddle the fence a little bit. You don't need to know the exact boundaries, but you should be able to say, okay, this is probably a metal, this is a non-metal, that kind of thing. Now we're going to look at the physical states of all the elements. So remember how one of the properties of metals is that by and large they're solids? It's pretty true. So most of these, which again, I will indicate for you, something like that for all of our metals. Most of them are solids. Mercury, which is this one here, is an outlier. Okay. Likewise with nonmetals, most of those you've got a mixture of um, metals, uh, not metals, solids. That's the word I'm looking for. Gracious, y'all. You have a mixture of solids and gases. There is one thing that's a liquid, okay? But that's kind of an outlier. So this is a physical representation. Like, you can look and see how much of the periodic table solids. And this is just talking about at 25 degrees Celsius. So that's like room temperature-ish, maybe a little bit on the warm side. But under normal conditions, most things are solid. Some of them are gas, but most are solid. 
Now, this is a very detailed um, periodic table. And you don't need to know all of this, but there's a lot of information that you can glean from this periodic table. So we're talking about knowing what physical state, um, whether or not something is essential for a biological species, something is radioactive. So there's a lot of information that you can put on a periodic table and you can see patterns. So most of all of the things of the metals, we've got that they're malleable and we've also got some that are essential for biological species. Some of them are radioactive. So in, in the case of radioactivity, all of those are radioactive. All of these are radioactive. So you can see kind of trends and patterns in the periodic table when you look at the different um, characteristics of metals and things like that. We'll talk about periodicity and the repetition of trends and things like that later on, maybe like chapter five, we'll revisit the periodic table. So the periodic table, while you can, uh, we probably think about it as just being set in stone, this is what it is. There are actually still elements being discovered, bigger, heavier elements that go beyond what you see on the periodic table. And just like in everything else, when you bring more than one person together, sometimes you can disagree with yourself, but you bring in another person, you bring in a group of people, they're going to be arguing. So there's disagreements over how to name these new elements. But there's a way to kind of give them a, a pseudo name until they're named proper. You don't need to worry about that. That's just for your own understanding. And to remember that while, yes, you're learning about this, there's stuff in a textbook, chemistry isn't dead. There's still work going on, there's still research being done, and we're still learning. So a lot of the basic stuff that you're learning in Chem 103 is pretty well founded. There's still a lot of things being learned, a lot of nuances that are being learned every day. So don't forget that. Science is alive. We talked about matter, all the different um, ways to classify it talks about physical states of matter, talks about pure substances and mixtures and all the subcategories, metals, nonmetals, semi-metals. Now we are going to talk about some of the different laws and things that govern how these um, substances and mixtures and things work, how chemistry works. And so one of the biggies in the field is the law of definite composition. And that says compounds always contain the same elements in a constant proportions by mass. What does that mean? The translation is every compound will always have the same composition no matter where you find it and no matter how much of it you have. So water is always going to have two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. It doesn't matter where you find it whether it's in a puddle after it rain, in the ocean, out coming out the tap, water dripping off of a tree leaf, okay? It's always going to be H2O. That's all that the law of definite composition says, that a compound is always the same. The components of the compound always the same, and it doesn't matter where you find it. To talk about the components of a compound, we need to talk about chemical formulas. So a unit of matter that's composed of two or more nonmetal atoms is called a molecule. And you're going to need to know that as well. But we're talking about these compounds, we're talking about molecules, and how you represent these is using a chemical formula. So that's the expression of the number of atoms of each element in a compound. And I know we keep using water, pour water, but that's a chemical formula. We know that there's a hydrogen 
and there's an oxygen. There's a little subscript here that tells us that there are two atoms of hydrogen. There's no subscript here, so there's an implied one atom, all right? So that's kind of the stuff that we're going to be talking about in the next few slides. So here's another example of a chemical formula. So sulfuric acid, if you have a car, then you, whether you know it or not, you are driving around with a bunch of sulfuric acid, unless you have like a Tesla or something, okay? Those are electric cars. If you're using a car that has a battery, like a lead acid battery, the acid in it is sulfuric acid. Tesla's a lithium, lithium ion batteries, and that's a whole different thing, okay? So whether you know it or not, you know what this is, and you rely on it every day to get from point A to point B. The chemical formula for sulfuric acid is H2SO4. Each symbol tells you which element. So H, we said, is hydrogen. S is sulfur. And O is oxygen. Each subscript tells you how many of each atom there are. And when you don't see a subscript, like in the case of the S, there's nothing there, you just assume that there's one. So you're going to need to be able to look at a chemical formula and tell me how many hydrogens, how many sulfurs, how many oxygens or carbons or whatever it is. And you will have a periodic table. Um, I will post on Blackboard the periodic table that you will be able to use with all of your exams. So you can use that one when you're doing your homework or you can use, so Master in Chemistry has its own periodic table. You just use that. But when you're doing the chapter check-ins, when you're doing exam reviews and things like that, use the periodic table that I give you so that you're familiar with it. So we need to know how to write chemical formulas, not just interpret them. So the number of each type of atom in a molecule is indicated with a subscript. Subscript is that guy, the little number that's lower than um, everything else. If there's only one atom of a certain type, there isn't a one. So just like we said with water, there's only one oxygen, so you just put the O. I can tell you, hey, a molecule of vitamin B3 has six carbon atoms, six hydrogen atoms, two nitrogen atoms, and one oxygen atom. And I can ask you to write the chemical formula. So all you would have to do is know what the symbols are for carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, and write them out. So we've got carbon, and I told you six atoms. So that's your subscript for the carbon. Hydrogen, the symbol is H, and you have six of those. So that's your subscript. Nitrogen is N, and there are two atoms of that. And there's one oxygen atom, so we just put the symbol. So it's as simple as that. That's how you write chemical formulas. I won't give you anything super complicated or difficult. Now sometimes chemical formulas use parentheses to clarify atomic composition. So in this case, you have carbon, hydrogen, and then you've got this OH, which is a functional group. And if you don't take more chemistry, then you're probably not going to really care unless you take Chem 104 and 105. Then you will care. But these functional groups are kind of like um, they're groups of elements that kind of go together that you usually see doing certain types of chemistry, okay? So you don't need to know that, but usually you will see a functional group in parentheses like this, like this OH. And then you'll also sometimes see a subscript outside of that. So let's break that down. It's just like math. 
if I had a 2 outside of here, I would take this 2 and multiply it by whatever is in here. So in this case, 1 plus 1 is 2. So I would do 2 times 2 is 4. Okay. Likewise, I've got a 2 on the outside of this parenthesis. So I'm going to say that I have 2 oxygen atoms and 2 hydrogen atoms. So that's how you count those. So if we're going to do the whole molecule, C2H4OH2, we would have our two carbons, four hydrogens, then we'd have two oxygens, and two more hydrogens. So we can combine the hydrogens together if you're reporting this to say six hydrogen. Now you can leave it just like I wrote it or you can combine it together as six hydrogen. As long as you understand that this here means that you have two of each element in the parentheses. Now let's say that I had something a little bit more complicated in the parentheses. Just like with math, you're going to take this 2 on the outside and multiply each of the subscripts. So you would have 4 carbons, you would have 6 hydrogens, and 4 oxygens. See how that's 2 times 2, 3 times 2, and 2 times 2. That's about as complicated as it gets with chemical formulas. We're doing a little bit of jumping around because there's just so many topics to cover when we're talking about matter and energy. And what this chapter is really doing is giving you the vocabulary to be able to talk about the elements, talk about matter in general, substances, compounds, to be able to classify things and describe them. Okay, so. We've talked about all this matter business. Now we need to talk about how we can discriminate between the different types of properties. So there are physical properties and chemical properties. Physical properties, we're talking about a characteristic of a pure substance that we can observe without changing its composition. So for that, the best example is you can observe its appearance. Is it shiny or dull? Remember, that's how we can classify metal or gnaw, right? Metals are shiny. Non-metals are dull. That's a physical property. Melting and boiling points. You're not changing the composition. You're just heating something and seeing what happens. Solubility, so putting it in water or other liquids and seeing how fully it dissolves. You can observe physical state. All those things are physical properties, things that you observe without doing any changes to the composition. A chemical property of a pure substance, we're just talking about pure substances here, so that means compounds and elements. That describes the chemical reactions that it can do with other things. So we're talking about an example of that would be being able to combust with air. That is a chemical property, okay? In addition to physical and chemical properties, where it's things that you can observe 
or what some, what an element or a compound can do in terms of chemistry. We could talk about physical change and chemical change. So we're looking at something that has happened, right? A physical change is something that happens where the chemical composition of the sample doesn't change. So we're talking about changes in physical state. Melting, boiling, freezing. All of those things are physical changes. Compressing of a gas is a physical change because you're changing into volume. But the gas still has the same composition. Chemical change is a chemical reaction. So you're taking something and doing something to it so that it's no longer the same on the other side. If you've ever done this as a kid or seen it happen, you mix vinegar and baking soda to make a volcano, you're making a gas, you know, so that's, you're making something new. Another example would be cooking. So if you are a carnivore, like I am, I mean, don't get me wrong, I like vegetables and stuff, but there's nothing better than the sound of like a burger or something going onto a hot grill or like a cast iron pan. That sizzle, you can't beat it. And when you get that nice crust or that nice brown on something, that's a chemical reaction. It's not magic. It tastes like magic, but it's not magic. It's a chemical reaction. So cooking and baking, there are chemical reactions going on that the heat helps to um, expedite, okay? But remember, food is just chemicals. I know that sounds weird, but food is just chemical. So think about chemical change when you think about cooking, mixing like uh, vinegar and baking soda together. You're making something new. So what you started with is no longer the same. There's evidence that you can look for for a chemical change. So like in the case of the volcano, you're going to have the release of gas, which is bubbles. Okay, and that's enhanced because you usually put a little bit of dish soap in there so you can see the, the bubbles forming really well. It gets really sudsy, right? Then there's the release of light, or, or there's light or release of heat energy, okay? Light is another form of energy. So release of energy is some kind that you can observe. So you could say that, you know, flask got hot, or cold, that's the indication that something happened. There's an energy change, a permanent color change. So sometimes you can mix two chemicals that are just, you know, they both just look like regular old liquid, and then you pour one into the other, and all of a sudden you see a pretty yellow or a blue or a green. That's a color change that indicates chemical change. And during the course of doing all these chemical reactions, someone had the question of, well, okay, so what about the mass of stuff, right? So if I'm starting off with this much of A and this much of B and I'm mixing them together, how much C do I have? Well, the mass of the reactants that is, the, the ingredients before the chemical change or the chemical reaction is always equal to the mass of the products. So whatever it is that you make, the mass of that is going to be equal to the mass of the reactants before you mix them. That's called the law of conservation of mass. This is a simple chemical reaction. A plus B yields C. If I have two grams of A and two grams of B, I'm going to make four grams of C. That's an example of the law of conservation of mass. If I took 
the same equation and I told you I have 3.5 grams of A and my total of C is 7 grams and I asked you how many grams of B did you start with, you can subtract to get how much B you have. That's the law of conservation of man in use. That's as complicated as it gets. Okay, yeah. Talked about conservation of mass, and now we're shifting to talk about energy again. We started by talking about the kinetic molecular theory and how the different physical states of matter have energy levels associated with them. Solids are low energy, liquids are medium, gases high energy. There's other types of energy, okay? So overall, when we're talking about energy, you can pretty much put them in one of two categories, potential energy, kinetic energy. Potential energy is stored energy. So you get that from position or composition. Position, you've probably learned about in physics, if you took physics, but, you know, the ball on the hill, right? It's got a lot of potential energy. Composition, we're talking about chemical bonds. That's also potential energy. Then we have kinetic energy, and that's the energy that matter has as a result of its motion. So we talked about how gas particles are really far apart. They move around a lot. They have a lot of kinetic energy. And so they can be really far apart. This is like a classic physics example. I don't think people use cannons anymore. At some point, people may not even know what a cannon is. But I digress. Let's say that you did happen to have a cannon in your backyard. I hope you don't. When you shoot it out of the cannon, at the highest, at the peak of its height, that's going to be the potential energy at its maximum. So peak height, peak potential energy, which is PE. At the same point, the kinetic energy is at its minimum. As the cannonball falls, you have an increase in kinetic energy and a decrease in potential energy. Now, I'm not going to be quizzing you specifically on energy like this. It's not a physics class. You will see some questions on the homework about energy, so I want to make sure that you understand this example to be able to do the homework. But on the exams, I'm going to focus more on the stuff that came before this. Energy is important, and we're going to talk about it. There may be a question or two, but for my class, this from this slide forward, we're not going to do a whole lot of emphasis on the exam, but you will see homework problems on it. So now we have to talk about kinetic energy, temperature, and physical state. So we talked about solids and liquids and gases and how much energy they have. Temperature, which we talked about in Chapter 2, is the measure of the average kinetic energy of a system. So if I have a solid and everything is tightly packed like this, well, that could represent a lower temperature too because we're talking about the average kinetic energy of a system. These particles are not moving much, okay? 
At best, maybe they're vibrating. That's not a whole lot of motion. So that means low kinetic energy. But we can also talk about it in terms of temperature. Something that has a lower temperature is also going to have particles not moving much. Same picture, two different ways to describe it. So just like mass or matter, you can't create or destroy energy. All you do is convert it from one form to another. That's the law of conservation of energy. So the amount of energy that you started with, you're going to have that much on the other side, but maybe some of it is released as heat. Maybe you form new bonds, chemical bonds, you break some bonds. But the amount of energy in the system is still the same. It's just distributed differently. Here are all the different forms of energy that you're going to need to know, particularly for the homework. So heat, we've talked about um, extensively. It's linked to temperature. Light, we also kind of talked about where you can have a release of light, which is energy. So you can release or absorb light. There's chemical energy, so think chemical reaction. Electrical energy, so if you think about a battery, that's electrical energy, or just electricity in general. Mechanical energy, you could think about a pulley. You could think about pushing or pulling something. I'm talking about something physical, okay? And then nuclear energy, we're talking about radioactive substances breaking down, and they release energy. They release particles in the form of energy. So those are the six forms that you'll need to be familiar with. In a chemical change, and just like with um, all the other types of energy, you have energy transforming from one form to another. So if you have water and you add heat, that's what that 540 calories is, then you're going to make steam. So we're going from a liquid to a gas. Remember we talked about that at the beginning. You're adding heat. You're increasing the temperature. And now you're changing energy, right? You're adding energy to the system. The opposite is true for going from steam to water. So in this case, you're releasing heat. To form water. So we can put all those things together, the law of conservation of mass and energy, to talk about both of those things. So you probably heard of Einstein, and he's got a theory of relativity, E equals mc squared, and that relates mass and energy. So you can interchange the two. Mass can be converted to energy, energy to mass, but you'll never lose, okay? So this, the amount that you have on one side is always going to be the same as the other side. So the total mass and energy of the universe is constant. It doesn't change, it just shifts distribution. So that's chapter three. A lot of concepts, a lot of vocabulary. We're going to do some problems in class 
And these problems are going to be multiple choice, matching, um, true, false, that kind of thing. No math really to do. So you don't have to worry about that for the exam that's coming up, but this will be on exam two. So you still have your chapter three check-in, mastering chemistry, homework, and quiz. All of that stuff is due on September 16th. Just know that you have exam one coming up, which is available starting September 9th, and it's going to cover the first two chapters that we did, which is the prerequisite science skills and chapter two. So I know that's kind of a lot. It's going to be hard to do the chapter three stuff when you're studying, but please, please, please make sure that you do the chapter three stuff. Don't fall behind because it's really difficult to regain that momentum. So hopefully this wasn't too much for you. It was a little bit lengthy. I wanted it to be a little less than an hour, but it is what it is. If you have questions, we'll talk about it in class, or you can always set up a time for office hours. Until then, see ya.